probably are not as self-evident to everybody. So that, so that's we, the only. We caveat. won't speak in acronyms. Well, uh, I'll try my best to not use. Yes, um, maybe yeah. you know some things are not. You know, if we have to explain the filibuster, well, <laughs> I think it may take a, six or seven hours. You know? Yeah, we need two yeah. sessions for that. Yeah. We're trying. To That's right. No, I don't, I don't think we really got into that. Even though I don't know. Do you want us to? Sure. You want please. us to keep it on mute when we're not speaking? I assume is that better? Probably so better it, yeah. in order to avoid any echoes or other funny, you know, mechanical effects. By the way, did anybody see uh, uh, McConnell's piece in today's Wall Street Journal? No. Only to talk well, about it. He said if, if the Democrats try to kill the filibuster, it will be scorched earth. We will ask for a quorum <laughs> for any and any and all actions on the oh, chamber. And by this. the way, Kamala Harris's uh, you know, vote wouldn't count for a quorum. So nothing will get done. You are so advised, <laughs> I guess. That's the, I, mean, so, I, don't, I don't see what's different than what he always says. Yeah, but I, you know, it, he says we're not going to relent on this. Um, I, and I think he means it. Yeah, I'm sure he does. Again, I don't know. I can't predict, the, you know, what's going to happen, but he's. One of our problems as Democrats is we always show up with the Marcus of Queensbury rules tucked under our. We have to get tougher and fight fire with fire. Congressman, welcome. I can see you. Hey. hey. Nice hey. to see Good you. Morning. Good, morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, and thank you so much for joining us, sir. Absolutely. I think we're getting Small world. close to – well, we, we have, the time is now, actually. Um, so I would say that we should, uh, we should start, Okay. And we have time. We only have 45 minutes. And so let me let me just officially be begin this panel uh, and welcome to everybody. Welcome to the participants. Welcome to the uh, speakers. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for this uh, major international event uh, sponsored by Horazis. My name is Paolo von Schirach. I'm based in Washington, D.C., and I am the president of the Global Policy Institute, which is a nonpartisan um, uh, research institution. For whatever is worth, it. we are located next to Lafayette, Park, which makes us, you know, at least neighbors of the of the whoever is uh, the tenant in the White House. I'm not sure if that <laughs> has any any particular credibility to our to our activities, but I just thought I would put that. I will, I will ask, uh, um, you know, let me ask the first question. I, I can't uh, get on. I'm having difficulty getting on. Can you oh, hear me? Is this Mr. Eisenstadt? It is, but I, I don't see a camera function. You see, I see a picture of I've got something saying cocktail party pairs people for speed writing. I mean, I've gotten all sorts of crazy stuff here. And if you keep going, you should be able to find something that says join. Well, I've done that three times. I'm so sorry, but I can hear you. We can hear you. We can see your picture. We can see your picture and we can hear you, sir. I'm not sure if that's good enough, but if we could see you live, that would be better. But Well, it would be. Uh, I'm not sure where the camera function is here. I wish I could provide technical assistance, but I am, maybe somebody else, I have no idea. I mean, I, I hit all the things that were asked of me. I just, I don't see the camera. Oh, wait a minute, here. Something said stop video. I want to stop the video, I want to start it. Well, okay, it's unfortunate. I'm so sorry. I, I wish I could tell you what to do, but I... Well, there's a video function at the bottom, and it, uh, it's got an X through it. When I click it, nothing happens. Might have to allow your computer to access the, the camera, so... 
We can hear you. We can hear you fine. Can we just move on? I'm so sorry about the what? technical glitch. Yeah. Nope. Yes, they can Is it okay if we start? Yes. Again, sorry, sorry for the inconvenience there, but I, I hope it can be resolved. Anyway, uh, gentlemen, uh, and 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 thanks to the audience, uh, you know, to all of those who are kindly attending uh, this uh, session for participating. Needless to say, American politics has been a, a rather eventful in the last uh, few years. We've got, obviously, you know, to, to not to belabor on the obvious, we had an election, we have a new president, but it, but the picture is not as clear and, and, and as obvious going forward as some would like to see it. So my first question to all of you is, uh, uh, how are the two main po U.S. political parties evolving? Very broad question. Is there a chance to find legislative compromise in the middle, as it used to be? Again, for all of us, uh, it's pretty obvious here. But for foreigners who are following us, you know, compromise has been the hallmark of American politics. And usually whoever gets to be elected president, they try to find a majority in Congress uh, that is beyond uh, the narrow count of the votes uh, of, of their own party. So starting with you, Congressman, just to put you on the spot, <laughs> what, you know, since you're right there, can you tell us how you see things from a Capitol Hill perspective? Thank you. Sure. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, yes. very good. Well, thank you so much. Good morning to everybody. Thank you, Paolo. And it's so nice to see you, Joel and uh, Michael and John and, and uh, Stuart. Thank you so much for uh, allowing me to address you and this question. Um, I think it's fair to say that the parties are always evolving. Um, on the Republican side, um, I think they're still in the thrall of uh, a certain... Uh, Donald Trump, and um, I think Mar-a-Lago still seems to be a destination for uh, many of my colleagues uh, with regard to uh, uh, various events uh, as they try to decide uh, how they proceed um, on different issues. And so that um, makes it a little bit harder than otherwise uh, to negotiate and come to compromise. All that being said, I think Joe Biden um, is universally uh, regarded as a decent man with a good heart. And uh, that's a good place to start. He's a likable person, and he's not someone who fans the flames. Uh, and because of that, we're able to start to work with people on the other side on certain issues and um, actually talk turkey and get to uh, agreements. In my particular case, I focus a lot of my time on post-secondary education issues, uh, including um, something called uh, uh, skills-based or vocational education, uh, which two-thirds of Americans utilize. And so I've worked with my colleagues on the other side to author the modernization of this particular type of education. And I think it's going to be important as we go forward because, quite frankly, um, those without a four-year college degree feel a little more alienated from our economic and political systems. And so we have to do everything we can to upskill them so they can participate in the global economy. And they're less likely to roll the dice on extreme candidates. Thank you, sir. Uh, who wants to go ne next step? Anybody? If, please. Well, I'm, I'm happy to go. And sure. I, I agree with the... Uh, I agree with the congressman. Uh, I think that the challenge for the Democratic Party is to learn how to reach out again to America because 74 million people uh, elected Donald Trump. So there's, I've never seen a divide like this, although there have been many divides in American history. I grew up during the 1960s. 1968 was a horrible year in America, a lot of turmoil, a lot of division. Uh, but uh, the challenge for us as Democrats is going to be to learn how to reach out uh, to all those people that feel disenfranchised and, and, and uh, neglected because uh, Donald Trump didn't cause the division. 
uh, the division caused Donald Trump. You know, let's look at this man. He had no political experience. He was elected. Um, and a vote for him in 2016 was very much a vote against the Democrats. Uh, so that's our challenge as Democrats. The challenge for the Republicans is going to be to find a new way forward. Because the more we find out about this man, the more he's going to, uh, it's going to add to his demise. We haven't seen his tax returns yet, but I bet when we see them, there's a reason that he, he hid them for so long. So we're going to see his influence in the Demo- in the Republican Party wane, but it may take a long time because he got 74 million votes. And one thing you have to remember, and, and correct me if I'm wrong about this, Congressman, but the first thing about being a politician is getting elected. That's a really, really important thing to every politician. And when you have 74 million people behind you, that's very, very powerful. So I think we'll see his influence wane, but it's going to take a while. And I think the Democrats are going to have to step up to the plate. Thank you. Joel? Sure. Thank, thanks, Paulo, for uh, moderating this wonderful session. And it's great to see my old friend, Congressman uh, Krishnamurthy and uh, Senator, uh, Senator Brown. Thank you for all of your leadership and work. Uh, hopefully we'll get you a seat in the Senate soon. And, um, and John, it's great to see you again. I'll just add one angle to this, which is I think that while the politics right now, uh, certainly on Capitol Hill, are looking extremely polarized, I I don't think the American people are buying into it. Uh, I don't think the American people want it. And uh, we see some of that underneath the surface, certainly with the the recent American Rescue Plan, which is uh, roughly a $2 trillion uh, program that's going out across the country to every state government, every local government, uh, across the board, Americans are going to be getting significant relief uh, as a, a result of of, uh, of tremendous efforts by Democrats in Congress. But we're seeing Republicans at the state and local level embracing uh, this bill and embracing the kind of aid that it's giving. Uh, in my in my volunteer time, I, I'm a, an elected council member in in my town uh, uh, in Mer- in the Maryland Thank suburb, you. and we're ourselves going to get some support. And we see the county getting support. And across the board, people, uh, regardless of political affiliation, look to that. So I hope that this is something we can build on, because if we continue to stay polarized as, as we have been at the federal level, uh, it's going to just continue to um, exacerbate the, the inability of Congress to get things done. We're on a, a, a narrow, narrow sliver of movement in terms of congressional legislation uh, we have we see democrats just barely leading and any change to that formula could see stagnation up on capitol hill uh, i fear it, which doesn't really reflect what's happening on the ground how do we bridge that that's a whole other conversation thank you john uh good morning yeah thank you um i have follow up on joel's uh good point on the American uh, Rescue Plan, which, you know, I study voters for a living, and it's rare where you see 70, 75% agreement across partisan racial lines for, for policy. And even though no Republican, no Republicans in Congress voted for this after voting for two rounds of, of relief under Trump with, with Democratic support as well, the American people are united in what needs to be done to fight the, the pandemic, get jobs going again, help families, uh, particularly people with kids. And so I think the question, the challenge for politics is how do you create institutions that allow for this unity to move forward? Because Congress is pretty dysfunctional, at least on the Senate side, uh, in terms of the divisions there uh, and the use of kind of artificial anti-majoritarian measures to block change. Our media infrastructure exacerbates all conflicts beyond recognition. Uh, and we, so we don't have a lot of representation for that middle. There's no place for them to gather or for, what, for ways to, to express themselves. We have a two-party system. You have to pick one of them, as Mike said. And we know that Democrats are doing a good job of representing a broad range of people from AOC to Joe Manchin. The Republicans are more in, enthralled to Trump. Uh, but how do we as a country figure out how to represent what I think um, Gallup had? is 50% of the country identifies as independent now. So we, we've become less partisan in orientation, more independent, 
but we don't have systems of media and politics that allow for that to get any expression. And I think that's a real challenge beyond, you know, can we pass uh, middle of the road legislation? It's how do we as a country, when we have unity on what needs to be done, figure out a way to turn that into politics. And I think state and local officials tend to do that a little better. Um, you know, there's just particular challenges in partisanship at the at the at the at the, at the, at the national level. Um, but that's something I would look into. It's like how do how do we find new forms, institutional forms for Americans who agree on a lot, to turn that into action. Thank you, uh, Mr. Eisenstein. Can you hear us? Can you? I can. Can you hear me? Can you? Can you hear us? Yes. Okay. That, can you please uh, address this point? And the, if you got the question at the beginning. How are the two main U.S. political parties evolving? Is there a chance to find legislative compromise in the middle as it used to be? Uh, and you know a thing or two about that. <laughs> so, so I think that, that one of the greatest challenges we have is the collapse of the middle uh, and the spirit of compromise, which I have seen uh, firsthand working uh, in many administrations in which I've been involved, uh, from Carter to Clinton. Uh, that is almost non-existent now. Compromise has become uh, a negative instead of a positive word. Bipartisanship uh, is extremely difficult to achieve. And the bill that uh, passed the, the $1.9 trillion uh, COVID relief bill had to be done through a process called reconciliation, uh, which avoids the filibuster. The next major bill which would come forward, which actually would be very important in terms of our competition with China, is the so-called Build Back Better legislation, namely infrastructure. This is not just potholes and bridges. It's extension of 5G technology to underserved rural and urban areas. Um, it is uh, charging stations for uh, electric cars. It's investing in a whole range of R&D activities, which should have significant bipartisan support. But the question of how to pay for it uh, is extremely divisive. The Republicans are unlikely to support any tax increases. And adding another couple of trillion dollars to the debt unpaid for might be very difficult. So if we have to go back through the reconciliation process again, it will be doubly difficult. And it's not clear that it will work a second time. So the long and the short of it is we have a, an extremely polarized, uh, dysfunctional situation in the Congress. There will be things on which we can agree. For example, there's a tough China bill uh, making its way through the Senate. Senator Menendez is supporting it, but it has strong bipartisan support. There is, uh, I think, a consensus there. Uh, but even on something like what we call the Dreamers Act, which is the first step on immigration reform to provide a uh, path to legalization and citizenship for young people. Now, because of the polarization, even that more minor uh, uh, immigration reform may be difficult to do. So at a time when it's desperately important that we work together across party lines to deal with challenges at home, uh, to make us more competitive, but also to demonstrate to the world that democracy works and that autocracy uh, and China, China's version of governance uh, are not the future, uh, we will not be setting a good example unless we can find a way of bridging these gaps. So I would like to frankly uh, make the argument and hope we can, the Biden administration, which I strongly support, can make the argument this is not just a domestic issue. If we're really serious about being leaders in the world and, and dealing with the challenges from China, we've got to demonstrate that democracy works, that we can tackle our major problems in a bipartisan way. But we're not there, certainly, at this moment. Thank you very much. That's a pretty good and comprehensive answer. For our international audience, just a very, very quick note, because, uh, you know, uh, 
which refers to the way in which our legislative bodies in the United States operate. The Senate of the United States is a unique uh, 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 deliberative body whereby there are strong protections for the, for the minority. Let's put it this way. If uh, just one senator objects uh, to anything at all, you need at least 60, you have to make sure you got 60 votes to defeat that objection. And, uh, and 60 votes is a pretty, pretty high threshold. Right now, the Senate is divided 50-50 with one tiebreaker, you know, if needed uh, by the vice president. However, for most legislation, except, you know, reconciliation, which Mr. Eisenstein alluded to, you need 60 votes, fundamentally. That's, it's more complicated than that, but the, the, the long and the short of it is this, which makes it extremely difficult to get anything done at all unless there is compromise. And compromise is elusive under the present circumstances, notwithstanding, you know, Mr. Biden's, uh, you know, promise and, and offer of bipartisanship and, and finding common ground in the middle, et cetera. Let me move to the next question. Um, uh, and, uh, and that would be the GOP. Uh, Mr. Brown correctly pointed out that Mr. Trump did not invent the current situation. He kind of inherited it in a sense. And yeah. he got elected in 2016 in very unusual, I would say almost bizarre circumstances, but he got elected nonetheless. Uh, and then he ran the country the way he did. And he, quite frankly, he almost got reelected, let's be frank, in, in 2020. Mr. Biden won fair and square. There's no question about it. But his margin of victory in the Electoral College, not in the popular vote, is very narrow. So is is the, as a, I think it was it, uh, Tom Friedman who said the first to that or others followed that the GOP is now the Trump cult party? Is, is, still, is this still the case a few months after national election, which essentially rejected Mr. Trump as a national leader? Does he have still a firm grip on the party? And if so, what does that mean, considering the rather unusual uh, features of this uh, person as a leader? Um, Congressman, back to you. <laughs> what do you say <laughs> about the, the leader of the loyal opposition, we used to call it once? So, um, you know, I have to say that Donald Trump still commands the allegiance of uh, much of his party. Um, he's very popular among his party. Uh, the last polling I, I saw showed that he was popular with 70 to 80 uh, percent of the GOP that was polled. And among my colleagues, quite frankly, um, if they don't uh, outright support him, they fear him because he can easily uh, whip up opposition to them in a primary race. And for so many of them, that is really what they have to fear, a primary as opposed to a general election because of the nature of our districts being so gerrymandered and skewed um, either to the right or to the left. Um, all that being said, I think January 6th um, did get people thinking differently about Donald Trump. Um, just outside this window right here, um, a bomb was found 200 feet away from my window, and uh, that was uh, on the day of the insurrection. And um, I think that uh, really prompted people to think very hard about how far down the path they want to follow Donald Trump and whether uh, they want to um, uh, follow him to the point of perhaps violence, uh, which is what he inspired that day. And I'm glad that uh, some of my colleagues at least uh, broke from him and even some of them voted to impeach him in, in his trial in the Senate that followed a second impeachment of the president. However, I have to be candid with you, those viewpoints are still in the extreme minority within the party. And as a consequence, um, we are going to have to deal with the specter of Donald Trump, even at the same time that we're hopeful that Joe Biden can help to stitch us closer together and move us in the right direction through this pandemic. I'm hoping that the pandemic offers a chance 
for us to work together on the vaccine rollout, which I think is a nonpartisan or bipartisan national objective. Um, thankfully, more than 70 million Americans have been uh, vaccinated, and that's a very good thing. And then secondly, uh, fully open the re- economy. Again, I think that's a nonpartisan or bipartisan objective. And if Joe Biden can accomplish those two objectives, namely vaccinating the country, getting everyone a shot in the arm, literally, and then reopening the economy, I'm hopeful that people will um, slowly look to Joe Biden's model of leadership more than Donald Trump's. Well, thank you. That's a hopeful, uh, uh, you know, a statement. Thank you for that comment, uh, Joel. Let's do the same in the in the same order again. Or no, we started with. Sorry, was it Mike first? Yes. Yes, sorry. Mike. I, just, I I think that's a pretty good analysis by the congressman. But I would just add. Uh, we need to look at what's happening now in America from his influence, from Trump's influence. We've got 33 states that are trying to modify access, uh, voter access. And this is all predicated on the fact that he was able to tell a false narrative that Joe Biden didn't win the election, that the election, electoral process was corrupt for the first time in 200 years. And people, especially in the Republican Party, most of them have bought that. So he's still continuing to do a lot of damage, and they're trying to set up the next election cycle by interfering. We've seen what they've done in Georgia and and many other states, 33 states. They control a lot of local legislatures, and those, since elections in America are actually controlled by each individual state, you have 50 different systems. So we really need to focus beyond Donald Trump on what's going out on at the state level, which through his, if you want to call it leadership, uh, he's been able to, to inspire people to attack the voting system with this false narrative that, that he spread. And I would just add to what John said. Yeah, it, we need to change some of our institutions. You know, you, you glanced over the filibuster, but this was a rule. It's not part of our Constitution. It's not part of the body of the Senate. It's a rule that was, was brought forth by Aaron Burr. So there are many institutions in our government that need to be reformed before we can move forward, I think. But I think we need to worry about Trump's influence beyond the Republican Party as well. Well, thank you. Again, if I may, I just chime in very briefly. I just read something. I don't know if it's accurate. Uh, uh, Congressman, you know, I, some many of your Republican colleagues, I think, are on record saying that they're not going to be vaccinated. Apparently, you know, getting a vaccine is not a Republican thing because Republicans don't get COVID. I don't understand that, or it doesn't exist or whatever. So that's a bit bizarre since we're talking about science here. We're not talking about politics, but apparently science is politics now. I, I, you know, let's leave this for another conversation. But, uh, but it's a bit weird, if I may say so. Um, anyway, Joel, would you want to please? Well, well, Paula, I mean, you, you've pointed, you put your finger on the, th- uh, on, on, on the, the, the real core of the issue here, which is uh, a set of common uh, understandings and beliefs that we typically historically uh, have, have shared as Americans in our political process. Uh, be it uh, facts <laughs> as a, a baseline uh, belief that American voters decide who gets elected to represent them at the federal level. Uh, what we just saw over the last half year or so was, uh, uh, I, I call it a sort of a political war of attrition. Uh, we, we saw across the country massive efforts at the grassroots level and amongst local elected officials uh, all the way through Election Day and into and through all the way up until inauguration, uh, efforts to ensure that we don't, uh, we didn't convert into a, a, an autocratic system of government. Uh, we had two thirds of the American population turn out this last election, and there were two months of effort to try to disenfranchise multiple millions of them. And as John points out, uh, the efforts are now fully underway uh, at the state level to try to disenfranchise millions of voters predominantly. Uh, minority uh, voters and people of color. Uh, and that's intentional. 
And so I, I, you know, I think what I look at is, is uh, uh, do what I say, not what I, what I do. Check, check the results. Um, there's been no punishment for Josh Hawley, senator who helped to mobilize the insurrection, uh, the, the, the mentality of the insurrection uh, on January 6th. There's been no punishment for Marjorie Taylor Greene, the congresswoman who is a conspiracy theorist and uh, uh, engages in anti-Semitic. Uh, and extremist um, uh, trolling, um, no consequences whatsoever for them. Uh, there has not yet been a commission to study the, the insurrection because Republicans are balking at the idea of doing this because it somehow undermines their identity by actually trying to understand what caused thousands of Americans to riot at the Capitol and kill five people and nearly destroy our system of government. So uh, if you can tell by my tone, uh, I do think this is still Trump's party. Uh, I think that there is a political incentive to play to that base for, as the Congress pointed out, for, for many of these potential candidates and these electeds, because that's the way we're structured right now. Uh, to go on TV uh, in the conservative media, one has to sound like that to get airtime, and that airtime converts itself into campaign support and political support from Donald Trump, but not just Donald Trump. So um, we're still in the throes of this. Uh, it's a little bit of a pause. It's a little bit of a quiet moment. We have a, a, a government that is trying to return us to some semblance of normalcy. But this is a pause. This is not the end. And so I, I think that, um, I'll just close with this, I think that to ensure that this doesn't just stay as a pause, but actually becomes a real reset, we have to be very open-eyed about what is uh, the current state of the Republican Party political uh, machine. And it is Donald Trump's machine. John? Uh, yeah, these have all, I mean, great analysis everywhere. I, I'll just add, it's weird to me that there's not more self-interest in the Republican Party. So Trump basically backs his way into an election that he, you know, he lost the popular vote in 16, um, ran the Electoral College map, then proceeds to lose the House, lose re-election, and cost him the Senate. And then he attacks with his people, attacks the government. And yet, from the data I've just seen from the president's pollster, two-thirds of Republicans are still behind him. So... I don't understand at what point self-interest kicks in for Republicans. They're like, this guy's a loser for us. The country doesn't like him. Uh, it doesn't matter whether our party likes him or not. He's not going to win. And, you know, that obviously has not sunk in yet. They seem to think that he, he still is a winner for them. Um, and it may be if they have a decent midterm that they think that even more. But it's pretty obvious that the, the president blew his reelection pretty seriously. I mean, Biden was a tremendous candidate in many ways, but, um, you know, all Trump had to do was to show a modicum of sense and compassion in the middle of a pandemic in order to get reelected. And he didn't. And he's not capable of it. And Americans know this about him. And now they have a, an empathetic, decent, smart president and they don't want to go back to Trump. So it, it doesn't matter what we think about this. The Republican Party and its voters have to figure out that Trump is not the future for them. And I'm not sure they figured that out. Uh, at least according to all the data I've seen. Um, and the biggest problem for them structurally will be if they have 16 candidates who are not Trump again next time, Trump will easily win the nomination. Um, and if Biden is probably up for re-election, you know, he'll, he'll lose it. Trump will lose again. So I don't know at what point self-interest kicks in, but that's what I would, I would focus on. The internal aspects of the Republican Party, at what point do, is there enough people saying, this guy is a dead end for us, we need to go somewhere else. Mr. Eisentag. Uh, yes, let me, uh, let me add a couple of points to the excellent analysis. Number one, it's important to look from a policy perspective at the extent to which uh, Mr. Trump has changed the entire policy perspective at home and abroad of the Republican Party. The Republican Party traditionally was an internationalist party. It was a free trade party. For example, during the Clinton administration, we used to have to depend uh, for major free trade agreements on getting Republican support uh, in the House and Senate because uh, many Democrats uh, were suspicious of trade. It was a small government party. Uh, he's converted it into a populist, nationalist, neo-isolationist, protectionist party. It's remarkable. A remarkable change in philosophy, number one. Number two, the person who is on the hottest seat 
uh, in the Republican Party is the minority leader, formerly majority leader, Senator McConnell. Uh, he desperately wants to flip the Senate in the midterm elections in 2022. Historically, you can go back decades, the party in power in the White House normally loses seats in the House and the Senate. So this razor thin majority that we have in the House and Senate could very well evaporate. But the danger that Senator McConnell has is that he has 22 Republican senators up and Trump has said he's going to attack those incumbents like Lisa Murkowski, for example, in, in Alaska, who have dared to buck him. So he, McConnell, is in danger of having internal warfare in the Republican primaries in 2022 instead of going uh, together uh, in a more united fashion. And third, uh, to show you a quite remarkable thing that's happened just within the last 10 days, is that that he will use to support his type of candidates. He doesn't want any money going from the Republican National Committee to anyone with whom he disagrees. This is extraordinary. We've never had a situation like this. So with all the popularity that he has, has been mentioned, he's unwilling to let the Republican National Committee use that as a way of raising money. He only wants that for his own political action committee to support his own candidate. Sorry. Thank you so much. Uh, I guess we have time probably for one more question. And I think, it, you know, Mr. Eisenstadt alluded to that right now. Yes, historically, we know that uh, the president's party loses seats. There are some exceptions, but usually they lose seats in the midterm elections, which, as we all know, will take place in 2022. And indeed, the, uh, the Democrats have a very narrow majority, both in the House and a, and a, and a majority of one with a tiebreaker you know, vote of the vice president in the Senate. If, if indeed... You know, the Democrats lose the majority, even either one, both houses or one. What happens? Are we, do we have kind of a blockade government and congressmen? I mean, you are there, <laughs> you will, you know, you'll be there, you know, and suffering the consequences of that should that happen. How do you view that? And I don't know, it's hard to make, you know, predictions and especially the predictions that may against your own party. But how, if that scenario should come to pass, are we going to see the last two years of Obama again with the, nothing getting done simply because the, the president doesn't enjoy a majority in Congress and try to legislate via executive order? How, how does that going to work? Well, uh, thank you for the question. I think you said that we, uh, uh, if we lose seats, um, uh, and you exempted me, so thank you for, for that. I of course. I appreciate your uh, uh, about confidence. Um, it, it's going to be uh, quite an election. I think at this point, um, uh, Joe Biden is off to a very strong start. And I think the American Rescue Plan Act is going to um, do a lot of good, not, in, not just in terms of getting us through this pandemic, but a lot of political good as well. And I, I, uh, I think it's going to pay dividends in 2022. All that being said, I think Joe Biden works extremely well with Republicans. Remember, he is a product of the U.S. Senate, having spent 36 years in the U.S. Senate. Um, indeed, I think uh, Mitch McConnell, uh, who I, I don't know if he has any friends, but he calls Joe Biden his friend. And um, I believe him. I take I take him at, at his word on that. But um, my, my understanding is that they have a good relationship, and I think that he would – uh, the two of them would work uh, productively. I think the most important thing, though, is um, what happens between now and then in shaping the 2022 elections and indeed what happens in the Republican primaries. Because uh, in a lot of races, there are going to be Trump Republicans 
and they're going to be, um, shall we say, non-Trump Republicans duking it out. Um, and it'll be extremely fascinating to see um, what happens in those contests and whether the non-Trump Republicans end up winning some of them. Um, if they do, uh, that will create a real uh, opening uh, for our president, the Democratic president, uh, Joe Biden, to be able to uh, maybe form a working majority between Democrats and the non-Trump Republicans in a way to move forward together. It would be a creative coalition building exercise, but I could easily see uh, some of these non-Trump Republicans pulling off some upset victories in different primaries, especially in the Senate. Um, and um, all of a sudden you have a very interesting uh, group of people uh, that you're working with in Congress. I have to sign off. I'm very sorry. I have to go to a hearing, um, but thank you so much. And, uh, Thank you for allowing me to participate on this panel. Thank you. Thank you, Congressman. We really Thank appreciate you, your participation. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you very much, and good luck with your legislative activities. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Mike Brown, and again, I'm asking politely everybody to be kind of brief because I see, unfortunately, the clock is uh, ticking, and we have about five minutes left. So try I, I, would just, I would just add that I think the two most important things that have been said is what Mr. Eisenstadt said about there's been a fundamental change in the Republican Party, and then Mitch McConnell's got 22 seats up, and that's that's very that's a lot of vulnerability. And what John said about the Republicans having to come to grips with the fact that this guy's not a winner. Uh, look at Georgia; it, 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 he could have intervened to screw things up in Georgia in those Senate elections, uh, better if he had it all planned. Uh, Georgia, the last person that was elected to the Senate in Georgia as a Democrat was a guy named Zell Miller 20 years ago. It's a solid Republican state. In fact, uh, um, uh, Trump won most of the counties in, in Georgia, but he went in there and it's going to dawn on the Republicans that they might have held one or both of those seats if he hadn't intervened. And I think that this reality is going to sink in and you're going to see more of the non-Trump Republicans winning because they understand that they still have, you know, a lot of potential. They, they increased their number in the House and they would have won the Senate if it hadn't been for Donald Trump. I'm convinced. Thank you very much. Again, very briefly for the for the other speakers, because we've we've been advised we're running out of time. Joe, please. If one of the chambers flips, uh, if there's a, a Republican House or, or a Republican Senate, uh, I think we'll see all legislative activity end, except for basic bills to fund the government. Um, that's why there's such a push right now amongst Democrats for filibuster reform, uh, or in fact, getting rid of the filibuster. Uh, uh, as many senators advocate, but probably isn't likely. But that push is because of a concern uh, about demonstrating results for the American people to protect the majorities in both chambers. And the sense is that Mitch McConnell is trying to block filibuster reform primarily to prevent results from, ta from, from, uh, uh, from taking place and being seen by the voters. So it's very tied up together. And uh, I, I do think that we're in for a very, uh, very dark period of, of uh, political paralysis if one chamber flips after the 2022 elections. Joe Biden, regardless of his relationships, and, 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 and I served in the Senate when he was a, a senior senator there, and, and he's wonderful and he has great rapport. But these political incentives are so heavy right now on the Republican side to block uh, and, and get back power that, that it's very hard to overcome in these votes when they're this tight. Thank you. I ask that the, to be telegraphic now because we're, so that everybody can have a last word. John. Um, elections are mostly local, so the Democrats need good candidates, obviously, but they've become increasingly nationalized. So Biden and the Democrats need to make sure people know that they've got the pandemic under control, jobs are coming, the economy's booming, and the other party is Trump and conspiracy theories. Uh, 
So I'll leave it at that. That's how you might be able to beat the historical uh, norms. Thank you. Mr. Eisenstadt, you have the last word. Thank you. Yes, I want to add to that. I, I agree. I think the be best chance we have of avoiding the historical switch against the party in the White House is that we're going to have a good vaccine rollout. There should be a reduction in hospitalizations and deaths. And the economy, by all estimates, is going to be booming in 2021 and in 2022 with jobs, uh, with uh, higher growth up to perhaps five and a half to six percent. Uh, the Fed chairman just said that we're not likely to have an increase in interest rates this year. So if you go into the midterm elections with that kind of a record, you have a chance of beating the odds of a switch. All right. Well, that's a that's an optimistic uh, statement. Uh, again, we've heard uh, you know mixed views. I really appreciate uh, your your contribution, contribution, gentlemen. So, on behalf of Horazis, I thank you for this uh, very good panel. I hope our audience enjoyed it, and I think uh, it's about time for us uh, to uh, switch off. So, thank you very much. Thanks, all of you. Thanks, Thanks Alan. Yep. Thank you so much. Thank you. Leave us early. Nice Thank talking you. with everyone. It was an yeah. honor. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.